Good evening. good evening. Again, it is good to see each and every one of you here on this blessed day that we can come together, that we can examine God's Word, sing such wonderful praises uh, in recognition to God's truth. There is that mansion upstairs up there where one day we will get to if we hold to the truth as we worship as we talked about this morning, if we hold to those old paths of righteousness, and we will be with each other forever. And what a truly great blessing and hope that is in each of our lives. This evening we will be continuing our series of lessons with the theme God by name where we've been looking at Old Testament names for God either directly given by him or by his servants for him in relation to uh, a reaction to or recognition for who he is, where we've been really looking at and examining those characteristics or those things by name given to God and how our relationship can benefit from that. Last week, we looked at Yahweh Sabaoth, or Lord of hosts, and how he is truly God above all gods and also commander-in-chief of the Lord's army. Today we will focus our attention in the verse of Judge or in the book of Judges, chapter 6 and verse 24, which we'll look at here in a moment. But before we read that passage, I wanted to give us some context to what exactly is going on there in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6 opens up right after the reign of the previous judge which is uh, Deborah, or Deborah, depending on how you say it. And she had reigned 40 years, and as was typically found when the judges reigned, there was peace, there was prosperity, there was good things that took place. Israel was uh, well taken care of, in other words. They didn't have to worry about enemies or anything like that. But as Judges chapter 6 and verse 1 declares, the people forgot God. They did what was evil in the sight of him. And because of this, the Midianites overpowered the Israelites from 40 years uh, with Deborah's reign to that seven years. There was a seven-year gap there. And for whatever reason, after her fall, for that next seven years, Israel did not follow God. They did not worship him like they were supposed to. They did evil in his sight. And as is typically the case, especially in the book of Judges, we see God sends a, a different group of people to wake his people up. In this case, it is the Midianites. And in fact, they come and with great power and great strength, of course, God on their side, they scatter the Israelites. They flee to the mountains. And for the next seven years, they're living in caves. The text even goes on to say that the crops every year that they would try to build, the, Midian, uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east, it said, would come knowing their plight and would take all their crops. Not just take their crops, but kill all their sheep or take their sheep, kill all their donkeys and even their oxen. It was a total annihilation. In other words, they were in great distress. It's after these seven years, starting in verse 11, we read of the man who would become the next judge of Israel, Gideon. And the angel of the Lord, whom we've talked about before from Exodus 3.14 and John 8.58, we know is Jesus. The angel of the Lord comes and is found by Gideon sitting under a tree. And he appears there and he starts talking to Gideon, who's uh, taking care of some wheat in which he has harvested, that he's hid in a wine press because he doesn't want the Midianites or anyone else to know he has it. This is the state of the Israelites. They're hiding things. They're, they're covering it up. They're trying to, uh, though their enemies not see what's going on. Just trying to have a little food, really. 
And as the angel of the Lord comes, he says to him, listen, I know you're a man of valor. I know you're a mighty man. And I want you to fight for me. Gideon is very unsure of this, of course. In fact, uh, he seems to be one of those who kind of tests uh, or, or puts God to the test a little bit uh, several times. In this particular case, he says, listen, the God that my fathers knew and that they talk about, who brought the people, my people out of the land of Egypt and did all these mighty works, we have not seen those works. And basically seven years, that next generation didn't know God very well. And he questions God about this. He says, listen, if, if you're really one who's worthy of worship, stay right here. Let me go prepare a gift or an offering. This is a non-blood offering. And, and let me prepare it and bring it back. Stay right here. And the angel of the Lord, that's Christ, said, listen, all right, I'll stay here. And Gideon did so. And Gideon comes back. And he brings that gift, that present, that offering, and he lays it upon, of course, uh, the stone that is there. And the angel of the Lord takes his staff, he places it upon it, and it's burned up, it's consumed. His worship is complete. When we look at Gideon's reaction then, as the angel of the Lord then disappears from there, his sight... Gideon then builds an altar in Judges chapter 6 and verse 24. Seeing and knowing the power that is proven in God now, he says this. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abyssalites. Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. Is the God, our God, whom we're going to talk about tonight. So how does knowing this about Gideon, and by the way, this is the only place this combination is found where we see the Lord Yahweh of peace here. Yahweh Shalom. How is it or what is it about this that can help us today some thousands of years later knowing about this God of the Old Testament, the same God who's yesterday, today, and forever? What is it about Yahweh Shalom that we can learn and help us get to know our God better? The reality is we live in a time, don't we, that's much like Gideon. No, we might not have uh, uh, armies pressing against us and stealing our food, but we live in a time that is truly of chaos, isn't it? In fact, it's a time of certain chaos. We only have to, as we discussed this morning in Bible class a little bit, we only have to turn the TV on or open a newspaper or, or get your news in any form or fashion. You see there's chaos everywhere. Satan's good at what he does, isn't he? In fact, he's very good at making this world acrimonious. The word acrimonious means caustic or rancorous, especially towards feelings, language, or manner. In other words, this old sinful world we live in is full of of acrimonious people. Those that are caustic, that are rancorous, meaning angry and upset at everything, concerning feelings, language, you name it, it doesn't matter. Everything is under attack. I don't know about you, but it seems to sum up what we seem to be seeing lately. And the reality is, this is sin-based. And truth be told, the more chaotic this world becomes, the more Satan is victorious in his endeavors, isn't he? Satan thrives in chaos, not peace and order, but in the chaotic. Satan has striven for years and even succeeded in making many Americans today think that, well, uh, the, the home and the family as God would have it is a farce. It's not important. It's not needed. 
group after group after group seems to be popping up over the last uh, 30, 40, and 50 years saying, listen, we need to do away with that Western nuclear family, that biblical family of a mother and a father and children. I can't tell you how many books from China and Russia and other communist states said, listen, we know how to tear down America. These are from the 1910s, 20s, and 30s that said, destroy the family. Any means necessary. Satan's been good at that. He's helped, as a puppet master, organize groups, hasn't he, to do so? Satan, in this chaotic world, he's done a number of things like this. He's striven for and even succeeded in many by making Americans think, that listen, these social, moral issues that we used to care deeply about, the fabric of society that people uh, held dear in their lives, those things don't matter. Alcohol and gambling and tobacco and fornication and all these. Listen, those things don't matter. It's amazing how we went so long in, in the drop in, in smoking and things like that. And then all of a sudden a new product comes up and it starts skyrocketing with our young people. The vaping and things like that. Satan's good at what he does. He gets people to think, listen, these things are irrelevant. They don't matter. And yet they bring chaos and disorder. Satan has striven for and even succeeded in making America think religion is of no value. We've talked about it before. Even those in the quote-unquote Christendom have started this movement which has destroyed denominationalism and the numbers are seeing that and it's affected the church as well. This idea that you can be spiritual without religion. In fact, you don't need religion. I saw a comment just the other day in talking about the Bibles that were being burned in Oregon. And this guy said, listen, we need to forget about Bibles. Just be spiritual towards God and have your feelings. It's religion that's killing us. We talked about this morning. That's obviously not the case. But nevertheless, it is something Satan has striven for and succeeded, hasn't he? He's brought and made certain chaos in so many people's lives, in so many countries' lives. All over the world, this is a reality. Satan is the true puppet master. The book of Revelation makes it clear that Satan has his strings on people's lives, on the souls of those who had listened to him, who want chaos, whether they realize it or not. Satan is the puppet master of sin and has made this old sinful world uh, acrimonious. Has made it caustic. John would declare it this way in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world... The desires or lust of the flesh, the desires or lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Every sin that there ever was fits into this category, one of these three, and is of the world. Not God's creation, of course, but the flesh of his people in sin. people for eons of time now have sustained sin and held the world in a chaotic state. And the sad part is many of them don't even realize it. Many of them, though here in America we're starting to see more and more of it and people are starting to wake up a little bit more to the chaos of sin, Nevertheless, so many are blind to Satan's whims and his flaming arrows, to his lies and his deceits. There is only one way, though, that anyone can have any type of peace that the Lord of peace can bring. And that's when we concentrate on the only way brought by the only God who offers the only perpetual peace. Perpetual peace in and of itself is the idea of serenity. 
The word serenity means, in its utmost, utter calmness. The opposite of chaos. As we discuss, the world brings utter chaos. It's certain with sin. It brings utter destruction. It brings this chaotic nature with it. Up is down. Right is left. Right is wrong. Isaiah would describe it in his day when he saw the same things going on. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Put darkness for light and light for darkness. Put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's not anything new to us. As I said, chaos from sin has been going on forever. But thankfully, for you and I, and everyone who wants that peace that surpasses understanding, thankfully for you and I, the God whom you and I are here to serve this evening, that are here to worship and recognize, to bow before in humility, and to give our heart, our all, and everything to the God whom we are here tonight to see and worship is not the God of confusion or chaos, but the God of peace. Paul would describe it this way in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not that of confusion or chaos, but of peace. That's who our God is. That's who we worship tonight. In fact, over and over in the Bible, he is literally called that, isn't he? The God of peace. When we think of that and we consider that and we look at that, he is without a doubt, Lord is peace. <coughs> Yahweh, shalom. That word shalom, though, is not necessarily... Uh, something that we might always consider when we think of peace. A lot of times when we think of peace in our lives, we think of the non-chaos, and that's part of it, but there's more of a specific nature to that word shalom. The Hebrew word shalom there literally means uh, the state of being safe or free from danger. The state of being safe or the free or freedom from danger. And so when Gideon built the altar, as we talked about the context before, when Gideon built the altar and he called God, the Lord is peace. Yahweh Shalom. What he was saying was his God, the God whom he had just worshiped, the God who had just demonstrated who he was, was the one who would bring safety and security to his life. That instead of waking up every single day and being afraid of what's around him, would give him the strength to make it through, would be his power, his might, would be there for him. And it's that same God whom Gideon served those many thousand years ago is the same God whom we worship tonight. That God of peace wants his creation, us, to live in the peace that surpasses understanding. That's why our God of peace sent his only begotten son to this earth to bring peace to our lives. In John 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Be safe, be secure, Jesus said to his apostles there, the disciples. He said, listen, I am giving you safety and security. I am bringing shalom, peace, because I am the Lord of peace. Galatians 3.15, Paul would say, inspired by God, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. The God whom Gideon recognized as Yahweh Shalom, Lord is peace, is our God of peace today. And he sent 
his only begotten son to bring that peace to us that safety and that security again paul would say in romans chapter 15 verse 13 may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the holy spirit you may abound in hope listen paul and peter and james and john all the apostles all those inspired of god they understood the power of what is being stated here the power of safety and security not worried about what man can do to us because god is on our side that's why god sent jesus to bring peace to our chaotic lives that's also why our god of peace gave us the gospel message isn't it that calls us to peace in acts chapter 10 verse 36 we read this as for the word that he sent to israel preaching good news or the gospel of peace through jesus christ not only did god send his son he sent the gospel he sent the good news the, that which brings, if we follow it, peace in our lives. As we looked at this verse this morning, we'll look at it again there in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. It ends with, God has called you to peace. Not only did he send his son, but the message is that of calling peace, isn't it? It's that of getting and putting away that old sinful man, that old man of sin and doing away with it, putting to death that sinful man and living for Christ understanding finding and recognizing the peace in god that surpasses all understanding yahweh shalom god not only sent sent his son to bring it and the gospel to call us to it and declare it but he also established the new law the law of christ by abolishing the other two that is a law of peace and one that brings peace. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, 14 through 17 would say this. For he himself is our peace. That's Christ. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments, expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. The law in which Christ established that he was sent to create, the covenant in which he established with his new people under a new name is a covenant of peace. This perpetual peace that God offers cannot be found anywhere in this world except the church and the family of God. When one is outside of that family, whether it be because they haven't obeyed the gospel or they're living a sinful life, there is no peace. It's that simple. There is certain chaos, guaranteed chaos, but there is no peace. The perpetual peace that can only come from God and can only be found in Christ is that peace which God promises us that will guard our hearts and minds against all the chaos that's around us. In fact, that's exactly what Paul said to the church in Philippi. In chapter 4 and verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, this world we live in, that as David would say in Psalm 51, we're born into, is sinful. It's chaotic. It's aggravating in many ways. There's so many things that can interrupt peace. And that's the way Satan wants it. He wants it to be a place of acrimony, of caustic and, and, and people hating everyone, not loving their neighbor. However, Yahweh Shalom, God who is peace, sent his son to bring peace to us all. And the same God who you and I serve this evening, whom we worship, sing praises to, who we honor with our lips and our actions, is the God who wants us to perpetually find security and completeness in Him. Yahweh Shalom for Gideon is Yahweh Shalom for us. God of safety, the God of security, the God of surpassing everlasting peace. As you reflect on your life and think of the things going on, if you find chaos in it, ask yourself why. Now, I'm not saying that our lives aren't going to be hectic. That's not the right word. Chaos isn't hecticness. Hecticness is just being busy having a lot of things going on. And the reality is, as Christians, we're going to deal with persecution and have to suffer persecution. As Paul would declare to Timothy, if we want to live godly lives, we're going to deal with that. Jesus said the same thing in the Beatitudes, didn't he? They persecuted him, they're going to persecute us. I'm not saying that we won't have hectic lives and have difficulties. What I'm saying is we don't have to have chaotic lives. Lives that are so scattered, that are not safe, and secure where we don't have peace no matter the things going on around us our God provides that if tonight you find yourself in that situation go to your God look towards him for that comfort and strength and let us help you as well as his family let us help you with that peace let us help you with that safety and security that's found in him. If tonight you need this family to help you in that, to put arms around you and help you with that feeling of security and safety, let us do that now. Let us help you as we stand and as we sing.